Shalom, everyone, and praise the Lord. Uh, welcome to our class on Romans. Uh, I hope all of you had a good weekend and all of you are ready for another week. Uh, we'll begin class. So we were looking at Romans chapter 4. Uh, we began looking at it, it on Friday. We we'll continue with Romans chapter 4. And before we look into Romans chapter 4, can one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Anyone can lead us in prayer? Father. In heaven, we thank you for this wonderful day. We thank you for the gift of life that you have given to us. It's not because of our power almighty, but it's because of your love. So, Lord, as we start this last lesson today, please, Lord, bless us, remind us everything. The Bible says in James 1, 5, that whoever likes you, then should ask from God who gives freely. So, Lord, please give us wisdom so that we can do, remember everything that is that we are going to teach us. So Lord, also bless our teacher. Please use her as a vessel so that she can communicate what you want in her way to communicate to us. I also pray for our dear students who are already in class and those who are not yet there. Also find time and join us for that opportunity. So Lord, also pray for the network where we disable in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and our friends. Amen. Thank you, Lubega. So we began looking at chapter four, we began studying chapter four on Friday, and we said chapter four can be divided into two main sections. Uh, one where, uh, you know, Paul establishes that it's, uh, that this faith that came before the law and the covenants, and he mentions Abraham, because for every Jew, Abraham is a patriarch, he's the forerunner, he's their father. So he says that Abraham had faith and he received uh, righteousness by faith. And uh, he says this happened even before the law and the circumcision. And he says that circumcision was given after uh, Abraham was justified by faith. So both circumcision and the law, Paul says, came after faith. So what he's saying is that faith did not show up after Jesus, but faith was there way back, uh, uh, you know, uh, with Abraham, even before the circumcision, even before the law. And so he's really trying to get their attention to that place. The other part of chapter four is um, Paul is giving us insight into Abraham's faith. Uh, what he's saying is um, that faith is what both Jews and Gentiles are going to walk in. Whether you are a Jew or a Gentile, you're going to walk in the faith of Abraham, which means you're going to be justified by faith, not by keeping the law, not by any rituals, not by circumcision. And he talks about Abraham's faith in God, and he says, you know, this is how we, uh, which means whether we are Jews or Gentiles, you know, must have faith in God. So what is the kind of faith that we need to uh, have? He talks about that in the second part of chapter 4. And um, from faith, he transitions to the next part, uh, which is grace. So he's taking uh, his readers, you know, uh, slowly into different aspects of the Christian faith. So we looked at uh, chapter 4, verses um, one uh, two was I think it was eight, um, and we were going to look at verses nine following. So in verses one to eight, basically Paul is establishing the fact that you know that the law is important. The law is not you know faith has come in, but the law is also uh, important. And he says that you know. Abraham was justified by his faith, or he was made righteous even before the law was uh, given. And how was he made righteous, or how was he justified? Um, it was because he believed, because he trusted. So when he believed in God, he trusted in God. He stepped out in faith. You know, uh, uh, it says, and he quotes Paul quotes from 
uh, Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, he says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, which means that when he believed God, you know, uh, God's righteousness was so, so to say, was put into his account or God's righteousness was imputed or he was covered with God's uh, righteousness or God's righteousness was deposited to him or credited to him or accounted for uh, him. So Abraham received righteousness by believing um, in God. And we also saw that, you know, um, uh, and this righteousness that the, he received is by faith. And so all those who believe uh, in faith, uh, believe God in faith, will also receive righteousness. Okay. And then he goes on to talk about uh, the other patriarch who is uh, David. Uh, you know, he talks about how David was um, blessed um, um, he was considered as a blessed man, even though he had sinned against God. Why? Because God imputed his righteousness apart from works, which means that, you know, God declared him righteous and brought him to that place of blessedness uh, because he was a man who repented of his sins. And, uh, you know, blessed is the man whose sins are uh, forgiven. And then he goes on to talk about, uh, you know, now since we've received righteousness, uh, by faith, apart from keeping the law, he says that even righteousness was given to us by faith even before circumcision, which means he goes back to talking about Abraham because Abraham was their patriarch. You know, he says that, you know, um, Abraham was not only justified by faith apart from the law, but also, you know, uh, you know he was justified by faith, uh, even before the circumcision was, the ritual was given to uh, him, which means that uh, it was not the law, it was not the, the sign of the covenant, which is circumcision, which made uh, Abraham righteous, but it was by faith, okay? So in verses 9 to 12, we see Paul writing about righteousness given by faith, even before uh, circumcision. So can someone please read verses 9 to 12, please? Does this blessedness then come upon the... or upon the uncircumcised also. For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it how then was it accounted while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness of faith, which he had while still uncircumcised. That he might be of all. Might be a father. I'm sorry, somebody is disturbing on my phone. That he might be a father of all who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also, and the father of circumcision to those who not only are of circumcision but who also walk in step of faith which our father Abraham had while still and circumcised. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Lubega. So it's amazing how Paul is revealing uh, the mind of God, you know, that faith is for both the Jews and the Gentiles. Okay. So having established from the Old Testament example of righteousness being given based on faith or, you know, righteousness uh, being received by simply believing, Paul then addresses this question of circumcision, okay? Uh, was this righteousness given because of circumcision? Because he knew this would come, in the, come up in the minds of the uh, Jewish readers or his the Jewish believers. So, hey, Paul has told us, you know, it's not the law. Uh, law is uh, not... Uh, the one that has made us righteous by faith, you know, um, um, 
you know, it is uh, not the law by keeping the law that we have received righteousness, but we have received righteousness, you know, based on our faith. Uh, that is the example that he gives of uh, Abraham. Now, Paul then addresses the question of circumcision. He says, was this righteousness given because of circumcision? And then Paul points out again to Abraham, uh, who received righteousness by faith. So you read in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, it says, before he received the sign of circumcision. Okay, so he says that Abraham was made righteous by faith, or he received righteousness by faith. And we see this in Genesis chapter 15. Verse 6, he says he received this even before God gave him the circumcision ritual or the sign of the covenant of the circumcision, which we read in Genesis chapter 17, verse 10. So Abraham was blessed, okay, and he received his blessing. And how did he receive his blessing? Okay, he received his blessing in verse 9. Okay, it says that. Um, uh, did he receive his blessing when he was circumcised or did he receive it when he was uncircumcised? He says that he received his blessing when he was uncircumcised and later on he received circumcision, which is a seal of righteousness of faith. So God gave him his, this covenant after God gave him righteousness through so the covenant of circumcision was given to Abraham after he was justified or he was made righteous uh, because of his faith in God. Okay, So the reason God gave him is the latter part of verse 11, so that Abraham could be the father of all who believe. Okay, So he's basically stretching uh, the thinking of the mind of the Jews, or he's stretching the thinking of the uh, Jewish readers, and he's saying, you know, um, the reason why God justified Abraham and made him righteous by faith, even before he gave the circumcision, even before he gave the law, was because he wanted believers to know that it is not by keeping the law, it's not by circumcision, but it is by faith in Christ Jesus that we will be made justified or we will be made righteous. So it's so beautiful that, you know, Paul, the way he, you know, he, he knows the mind of the Jewish readers. He knows what uh, who Abraham is for them, what he means to them. And uh, the way he just so beautifully brings in Old Testament, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, scripture and, uh, you know, logically just reasons and uh, discusses with them. And also it's so beautiful to see God's plan of salvation. Just imagine if God had, you know, given Abraham first the sign of the covenant, then the law, then and made him righteous, you know, then where would faith work? You know, faith would not work for any of us as Gentiles. We would have to keep the law. We would have to keep the circumcision. But it's so beautiful that even in the very beginning, God's whole plan of salvation was that, uh, you know, we would be justified. We would be made righteous uh, by our faith or through faith in Christ. Um, Jesus. So Abraham, before he had circumcision, he had faith. So Abraham is called the father of all who have faith. And so, you know, um, Paul is very smartly here saying he's a father of all who have faith, which means he's saying, hey, Jews, he's not just your father, okay? You hold him in high esteem. You're proud that Abraham is your forefather, is a patriarch, but he's also the father of the Gentiles. He's also the father of those who are not from the Jewish race. So you just look at how he, you know, he, he brings in his words. He says he's a father of all who have faith faith. That means he's saying he's not just the father of all who have faith, but he's also, you know, uh, someone through whom the blessings will flow. You know, God gave the blessings, the covenant to Abraham, you know, uh, so the Abrahamic blessing, the Abraham covenant. So the blessing is going to flow not only to the Jewish race, but also to everyone, even to the Gentiles uh, who are going to believe by faith. Okay, so beautifully, he just brings out all of these concepts. In verse 12, Paul is saying, it's not just circumcision, but you need to walk in the faith of Abraham. So yes, he's established the fact that righteousness is 
by faith. It's not by keeping the law. It's not by the circumcision ritual. That's the sign of the covenant. And then he says, Abraham is the father of all who have faith. And then he says, you know, hey, now you don't be very proud, you Gentiles, that, you know, you are also part of the uh, blessing or the covenant blessing or uh, the blessings that God is giving to Abraham. But he's saying, you know, you we all need to walk in the faith of Abraham. Look at how beautifully he just... You know, he just brings out his whole understanding, the whole reasoning here. So having established all of these facts, now he's saying that it's not about law, not keeping the law. It's not about circumcision, not being circumcised. But he says you need to walk by faith, to walk by faith, or you need to walk in the faith of Abraham. So he's basically stating two things here. He's saying Abraham received righteousness by faith. So that he will be the father of everyone who walks in faith, even if they are uncircumcised, which means the Gentiles, which he's talking or referring to the Gentiles. And he says they will also receive righteousness by faith. And so, secondly, he's saying, you know, Abraham is the father of the circumcised, uh, but it's not really of circumcision, okay? But you need to walk in the faith of Abraham, and that is what brings uh, righteousness. So here he's very beautifully talking to both the Jews and the Gentiles. So he's saying it's you don't you receive righteousness by faith. That's how Abraham received. So it's not by keeping the circumcision ritual. So the uncircumcised, which means the Gentiles, they will receive righteousness by faith. And then he's also saying, you know, secondly, he's saying, uh, you know, Abraham is a father of the circumcised. But it's not really of circumcision that you know, but you need to walk in the faith of Abraham. And that is what you know brings a righteousness. So Paul is saying, even if you are uncircumcised, you have to walk in the faith of Abraham. Even if you're a circumcised, you have to walk in the faith of Abraham. So imagine when a Jew is reading this, he would say, Yes, you know, I can't argue with what Paul is saying because he's saying it from scripture, he's so everything. He says that Abraham was made righteous by faith before the law and circumcision. Very true. And uh, the Gentiles can't say that, you know, uh, yes, through faith I can be made righteous and I don't need to be circumcised. Okay. So the Gentiles can say that, you know, we have been made righteous through, by faith and we don't need to be circumcised. Okay. So now Paul moves on to Abraham's faith. What was his faith? And what can we say about Abraham's faith? Okay. So just uh, saying it again, circumcision was a sign that Abraham already had faith and God had already accepted him and declared him to be righteous even before he was circumcised. So Abraham uh, is the spiritual father of those who have faith but have not been circumcised and they are counted as righteous because of their faith. And then we also see that, you know, he received the sign of circumcision, uh, a seal or a confirmation of the righteousness which he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So this was that, you know, he could be the spiritual father of all who believe without being circumcised. So that righteousness could be credited to them. So you can just see how... Beautifully, God's plan of salvation was there from the very beginning. And how Paul catches this whole truth. It's not that he catches it. It's just how the Holy Spirit reveals it to him. And how he just so beautifully, logically uh, explains it. And now when he's explained this, now he moves on to talking about what is the kind of uh, faith that Abraham had that we need to walk in that uh, faith. So what was his faith like? And what can we say about Abraham's uh, faith? And this uh, we will look at in verses 13 um, following. So promise based on faith because of grace. Uh, can somebody please read verses 13 to 16? Before we read verses 13 to 16, anyone has any questions? I have a question. Okay. Uh, so if you want to... I don't know if it's a valid question. 
but but in verse 11 it says he received the sign of circumcision and and the seal of righteousness uh, so why were it was not written like a sign of righteousness or why i feel like there might be any reason between the sign and seal does it make any sense as make any difference because we can also say sign of righteousness right so why the word seal was used there is there any significance behind it i just wanted to know <sighs> okay um a sign of the covenant of circumcision or the seal uh, basically also means a confirmation so the sign of the covenant of circumcision was a was sealing the fact of the covenant that God is making between Abraham and himself. It was a confirmation of the covenant that he is going, is making with Abraham and with his, with the his children's children, the generations to uh, follow. So he says he's saying he received the sign of circumcision, a seal or confirmation of the righteousness which he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. Okay. So he's saying that, you know, uh, while he was still uncircumcised, there was all the, the circumcision of the heart that was happening, right? That was a seal or the confirmation that he is um, made righteous in God's sight. And that is through faith. So he's saying that uh, the circumcision of the heart is what is valid, is the, the what makes you righteous by faith. It's not just the act of doing it. Okay, any other questions? Also, why is he saying that? So that, you know, he's saying that, you know, he could be the spiritual father for all those who believe whether circumcised or uncircumcised. Okay, so that righteousness could be credited to them. Okay, yes, Rubega, you have your hand up. Yes, I can, uh, there is the... We all know that uh, Abraham, when he was 70, was it 75 years old or in the 70s? This is when he left his father's land. But we see that Isaac came, la uh, Isaac came later in his life because I think the uh, circumcision was brought about on the eighth day of Isaac. He was told that when the sun turns eight days, he will be circumcised and all other male and what and what. So after the birth of Isaac, am I right? I don't really remember my my Old Testament very well. Uh, but yes, Rubega. So when Isaac was born, he was circumcised. But even before uh, Isaac was born, when God gave Abraham the circumcision uh, ritual, the sign of the covenant, he and all of his household were circumcised yes so those born after them would follow the same ritual but all of them had to go through that circumcision ritual when god gave them that as a sign of a covenant so it just didn't start off with isaac after he was born but it was even before that he and everyone in his household you know uh, went through this circumcision ritual Did that help? Yes. There is something. Uh, which we read in uh, Genesis uh, chapter 17. Okay, we'll move on. Uh, verses 13 to 16. Can somebody read that please? 13 to 16. Can anyone read um, Romans chapter 4, verses 13 to 16, please? Yeah. Romans chapter 4, verses 13 to 16. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are his, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. Because the law brings forth wrath, about, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. 
therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed not only to those who are of the law but also to those who are of the faith of abraham who is the father of us all amen so the promise that god gave to abraham was something he gave at the point of faith and righteousness before circumcision so the promise was through the righteousness of faith and it's not just you know uh, because of the law uh, it's not just who are of the law who receive the promise but it's everyone who has faith who will inherit this promise because abraham was justified by faith so he's saying that it's not those who keep the law or those who keep the circumcision ritual uh, you know would be made justified or will receive the promise but he's saying that everyone who believes uh, in faith will be made righteous would also receive this promise and it's uh, everyone who has faith who will inherit this promise so what is this promise you know uh, the promise is where god tells abraham i will bless you and i will make you a blessing to the nations okay this promise was given to abraham and to his descendants and it was given even before the law was given and this promise is not just given to those who are descendants of um, those who were given the law and those who were given the sign of the covenant and circumcision but it's also to all those who have faith in jesus Christ. So all those who have faith in Jesus Christ, Paul is saying, will inherit this promise, which means he's saying it's not only the Jews who will inherit this uh, blessing, this promise that, you know, where God tells Abraham, I will bless you and I will make you a blessing. But this blessing is also for everyone, including the Gentiles, whoever believes Jesus Christ, who have faith in Jesus Christ, uh, who trust in him uh, would, uh, and who have faith in him will inherit this promise. And so he says, hence, Abraham is the father of us all. And who is he the father of all? He's a, he's a father of all those who have faith. So he's the father of us all, the people of faith. So Paul is repeating his point that Abraham you know, is the father of all who have faith and all who have faith now receive the promise that God gave Abraham. So, and he says, this is according to grace. So basically what Paul is saying is, hey, it is faith, righteousness, and grace. So you believe in Jesus Christ, you have faith in him, you know, your righteousness is imputed, is credited into your account, you're clothed with his righteousness, and he's saying it's because of the grace of God. And he says it's given to everyone, to both Jews and to Gentiles. Okay. Now, in verse 17, he gets into the faith of Abraham. Very interesting. You know, he's uh, he, he's, he's telling uh, the, the Jews and the Gentiles, you know, now you've, since you've been justified or been made righteous by faith, you need to walk in the steps of the faith of Abraham. So what is the steps of the faith of Abraham? Or what was Abraham's kind of faith, which he talks about in verses 17 to 21? So can somebody please read 17 to 21, please? Anyone can read 17 to 21. Can Roslyn or uh, Anita Subashi, anyone can please read verses 17 to 21? Is anyone in the class? Okay, you're out. Subhashish, can you please read 17 to 21? Is Anita there, Georgia? Can we have some more participation, please? Can somebody read verses 17 to 21? Okay. Uh, 
Yes, go ahead, Lubega. It's chapter four, verses 17 to 21. Okay. <clears throat> as it was, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. In the presence of him who he believes, God, who gives light to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who, contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken. So shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not river at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised he was also able to perform. Amen. Thank you, Lubega. Uh, this passage is very interesting, a very interesting passage of scripture, verses 17 to 21. It's basically the Holy, Holy Spirit summarizing, you know, Abraham's life of faith. And uh, why do we say it's the Holy Spirit uh, summarizing Abraham's life of faith? Because it's the Holy Spirit basically inspiring Paul to write all of these things. So if you notice in these verses, there is no mention actually of Abraham's struggle or mistake that he makes. Did you notice that in verses 17 to 21? There's absolutely no mention it's just talking about Abraham's faith, but you know, it's, there's no mention of Abraham's struggle that he had. You know, it's, there's uh, all the mistakes that he made. Did Abraham make any mistakes? Yes, he did, right? Uh, in fact, um, if we did not read about Abraham's life in Genesis in Scripture, and we just read Romans chapter four, you know, we would we would think, wow, what a man of faith! You know, such great faith. Uh, but, you know, we know about the faith of Abraham that, um, you know, uh, he did have great faith, but he also had a faith that was at times wavering, that, you know, did not completely trust in God. But we know that the faith of Abraham, you know, when God asked him to leave his father's household, he stepped out in faith, but he did make mistakes. Twice he was afraid of his own life, remember? Uh, and uh, to save his own life, he said a lie, he said a partial lie um, about his wife. He said his wife was his sister so that he can be saved, his life can be saved. Otherwise, you know, they would kill him and take away his wife because she's very beautiful. Okay, so twice he said a lie, though it was a partial lie, yet it was a lie for God. There's no half life with lie. A lie is a lie. Uh, no, uh, just black and white, no shades of gray. You know, so uh, he did make a mistake. Okay, he was afraid of his own life. And we also know from Genesis chapter 15, you know, Abraham was tired of waiting for God's promise, right? Uh, God promised him when he was 75 years that he will have a son. And, you know, it, he tells God that, you know, you promised me and it's 15 years on this faith journey, but, you know, I'm going to have a son, but I don't see any signs there is no sign yet of the son of a uh, promise so he's asking god did you mean that i'll have a son through sarah or through others or anyone else born in my family like my servant's son would become uh the inheritor of uh, all of that, that i have and what does god do you know god uh, basically cuts a covenant with abraham right and we also know that after Genesis chapter 15, Abraham was prompted by Sarah. You know, Abraham and Sarah waited a long, long time. Uh, and, uh, you know, he may have thought maybe, you know, God meant that I'll have a son with anyone else in my house. So he births Ishmael through Hagar. And that was a mistake that he made okay so from scripture we see that abraham's life of faith was not perfect right 
But now, when the Holy Spirit is looking back at Abraham's life, or he's talking about Abraham's life, he's not mentioning anything about his failures. He's not mentioning about his weaknesses. He's not mentioning anything about his low days. And this is a powerful lesson. Uh, you know, it's a powerful lesson that we can learn. It's, you know, that in our walk of faith, we may have ups and downs, but God wants us to keep going. And ultimately, you know, we journey into that place of perfect faith. Okay. Amen. You know, we go through our journeys where we lack faith, we waver in our faith, we give up our faith, we lose our trust in God, we you know, sometimes do what we think is right. And, um, you know, we have all of these ups and downs and, you know, but God, yet God wants us to keep journeying along. He keeps, he wants us to keep going. And he knows that ultimately he's going to bring us to a place of perfect faith. And that is what happened in Abraham's life. Okay. So did Abraham reach a, a life of perfect faith? What do you think? Yes, no? You can at least type it out in the chat section. We're saying that, you know, in spite of all the ups and downs, God, you know, keeps us going. He kept Abraham going until we journey into that place of perfect faith. So I'm asking the question, did Abraham journey into that place of perfect faith? Jepina says, I believe yes. Anyone else? Did Abraham journey into that place of perfect faith? No answers? Okay. Yes, Anita, thank you. So when did he journey into that perfect pla pl place of perfect faith? <laughs> Maybe after. Maybe after? And then Maybe after a long time. <laughs> Maybe after a long time. When did he journey into that place of perfect faith? In Genesis chapter 22, you know, when God tells Abraham to offer his only son, Isaac. And what happens? Yeah, Rosalind, thank you. You know, when he offers, uh, 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 when God tells him to offer his only son, Isaac, now, did he turn around and say, God, did you get this wrong? Did I hear this wrong? You know, is this what you want me to do? You know, God would not, you know, want human sacrifice and that this is a son of promise. There's something wrong here. But what does Abraham do? You know, he basically sets out the very next day. He takes, you know, his son, he takes the firewood, he takes the fire and, uh, and, you know, he goes to the place that God shows him and he's ready to also offer up his son as a sacrifice. So we see that when God told him to offer Isaac, he listens, he obeys, not worried, not an ounce of doubt, no questions asked. And he just goes to offer him as a sacrifice. Why? Because he was convinced that even if he offered Isaac, God would raise him. Up. He came to that place of perfect faith. Look at what Hebrews 11, 19 says. Can somebody read that please for us? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19. Anyone? Can you please read that quickly? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19. Yes. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19. It says, I'm concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a physical sense. Amen. Thank you. So here it says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19, he received him as though he raised him up from the dead. So, you know, actually, as far as Abraham and God were concerned, it was though a resurrection had already taken place even before the sacrifice was 
made. So from the dead from which he also received him. So as far as Abraham was concerned, you know, Isaac was as good as dead. And it was from the dead that he received him back. Because, you know, just going to sacrifice his son, for him in his mind, it was, you know, as though, you know, Isaac was good as dead, right? He's already going to sacrifice his son in his mind. He's already done it, you know, from the dead. And that he received him back in a manner that, you know, prefigured the resurrection of Jesus Christ, okay? Now, for Abraham uh, to come to that place where he was fully persuaded that God would fulfill his promise, it did not happen overnight, right? It was not a smooth journey. But he got to that place where he was fully persuaded that what God had promised for his life, you know, God will perform it. So the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul is looking at that and highlighting that for us and showing us how we need to come to that place of perfect uh, faith, okay? Um, or mature faith. Look at what James chapter 2 verse 22 says. Can somebody read that please? James chapter 2 verse 22. James chapter 2, two verse 22. James chapter 2, verse 22. Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by his works, faith was made perfect? Amen. So it says, uh, through Abraham's work, his faith was made perfect, and the actual word here is mature. Okay? Uh, to be mature in our faith. Perfect means the actual word is mature. So how do we come to this place of mature faith? Uh, we see this in verses 17 to 21. Uh, so, you know, Paul is saying we have to walk in the steps of the faith of Abraham. And verse 17, he's quoting the promise, I have made you a father of many nations. And um, God put it in the in the heart of Abraham, and God decided that he would do this in the life of Abraham, that he was going to make him the father of many nations. And it's a done thing in the heart and mind of God. And Abraham is hearing this promise from God. So for, for God, when he's telling Abraham that, you know, I have made you the father of of many nations and God puts this promise in the heart of Abraham that God decided that he would do this in the life of Abraham that he was you know already has made him the father of many nations which means in the mind of God it was already a done completed thing even before it was in reality it happened in reality it happened in the life of Abraham it was also a done completed thing in the heart and mind of God. So Abraham is hearing this promise from God. So who is this God? Now this is a God who gives life to the dead and calls things which are not as though uh, which do not exist as though they did. Okay so who is this God? This God is the one who gives life to the dead and calls things uh, which do not exist as though they did. So two things about God that we can learn from here is God gives life to the dead. So things that look dead, God can resurrect, he can revive, and he gives life. Um, you know, we look at uh, a verse in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 12. Can somebody read that, please? Uh, we uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 12. Can somebody read that? Hebrews 11 verse 12. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 12. Therefore from one and were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. Amen. Now see how beautiful the language is. He says from one man who is good as dead 
from such a man came generations so many as many as the stars in the sky and the sand in the seashore so he's saying for one man who's good as dead comes a nation that is innumerable so this is telling some telling us something about god and how he works in our lives you know things in our life situations in our life can be as good as dead god releases something huge something big something unimaginable and that is what he did in abraham's life and how did abraham position himself to see that you know this is what paul goes on to explain in the upcoming verses when god speaks his promise to our hearts you know there are two things that we can learn when we when he spoke the promises in abraham's life the two things that we can look at it or when god speaks promises to our hearts there are two things that we can keep in mind that he's inviting us to believe in him who is the one who gives life to the dead amen right he is the one he is inviting us to believe in him who is the one who gives life to the dead so our situation can look hopeless helpless but it's not a problem to god and this is something that we need to keep in mind uh, when god gives us this promise okay and god calls things that do not exist as though they did okay uh, it's not that uh, it's not there but god says it is there so when when we say that god calls things that do not exist as though they did you know it it is like it, it's not there we can't see it but god says it is there okay we can tell god that we still haven't you know become but god says i have made you okay just like uh, tells abraham you know abraham could say god i have not yet become a father of even one son and you're telling me that i'm a father of many nations but look at what he says in verse 17 he says i have made you right so abraham can can say god i have not become but when god has made the promise and god is telling that you know he and he's speaking his promises in our lives and he is uh, you know inviting us to believe in him he's actually telling us that you know uh, you don't see it you've not become a father of even one son before you become the father of nations but he's saying i've made you okay so we can for example we can look at ourselves and say god i am weak but god can say i have made you strong this calling what does not exist as though they did we can look at ourselves and say god i'm not a conqueror but god says i have made you more than a conqueror you know you can look at god and say god that you know um i am uh, incapable of doing this sort you know i'm not worthy but god looks at us and says i have made you capable i have made you um, worthy okay so we can say that you know uh, god i have not yet become that but you know god says i have made you that and so god is telling abraham i have made you a father of many nations but abraham did not even have one child and he was not even a father but god says i have made you a father okay so one of the things we can learn from abraham's life in genesis chapter 17 is we see god telling abraham i want you to start calling yourself what i have made you from today onwards your name is changed from abram to abraham and your wife's name is changed from sarai to Sarah so start calling yourself what i have made you okay so you know even as god has given us promises in our lives we can start declaring over our lives what god has declared over us what god has promised to us or what god has made us in the spiritual realm it is already done it's a completed thing you know what god has called and planned for you Uh, but you know you need to start declaring it over your life and when you start speaking this promise in your life what he is calling into existence that does not exist he say this is what i made you it's not there 
but it will be there. And so when we join in faith with God, like how Abraham journeyed into all that God had for him, you know, he journeyed into what God had made him to be a father of many nations. Okay, so we'll stop here and just leave you with this powerful truth that just speak and declare what God is declaring over your life. And even as you look at things that are, uh, you know, God has spoken of your life and you see it dead, hopeless, you know, uh, as nothing, you know, God can uh, bring into existence what is not, you know, he can, um, he calls out things what does not exist as though they did. And when you look at yourself and you say, God, I'm not this, God looks at you and says, I have made you this. So declare what God has. Uh, made you okay so we'll stop here anyone has any questions any questions okay there are no questions we'll end class thank you all for joining class today and have a blessed week i'll see you on friday thank you everyone